Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. As they say, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. David thought his crime was behind him. Uriah was killed in the way that David ordered Joab, his general, to have him killed. Uriah's wife Bathsheba, with whom David had an affair, performed the traditional rituals of grief for her husband. Uriah, the war hero whom David had killed to cover up his indiscretion, had descended into a crime. David's affair with Bathsheba resulted in Bathsheba getting pregnant. That's why David summoned Uriah back to Jerusalem. David wanted Uriah to sleep with his wife so that everyone would think the baby was Uriah's rather than David's. But Uriah was too disciplined for that. Too disciplined to follow David's orders, even if the orders came from the king. He knew that enjoying his wife's company while the battle was still being fought betrayed the warrior's code of honor, a code that was that said to abstain from intimate relations until the battle was over. Some commentators, those apologists for David, trying to explain or even justify David's behavior, attempt to make the case that it was Uriah that committed treason for disobeying David's orders, and that's why David had Uriah executed. Some say that David had Uriah lawfully killed because Uriah disobeyed a direct order from the king, and many argue that David was the victim in this story. Of course, these are the same folks who say that Bathsheba was the aggressor in this encounter, seducing the king, knowing David's weaknesses. And Uriah, cut from the same cloth, disobeyed David out of malice. David was an innocent victim, and the forces of evil tried to bring down a good and righteous king, they said. But I don't buy that. In fact, I find those interpretations kind of disgusting. They often come from a strain of Christianity that kind of sucks up to power among those who protect the strong over the weak because they want to see themselves as powerful and they contort themselves to find reasons why powerful never make mistakes and that powerful men are the victims of those trying to bring them down. But there's nothing in this story to suggest that David was anyone but the aggressor. And the writer of 2 Samuel isn't afraid of injecting his own opinion into the story. And he has some pretty choice words for David. Because if it were true that David had Uriah killed because of disobeying an order, then why didn't David have him arrested before his execution? If this were a legal execution, then why didn't it happen in the open and according to their laws instead of being sneaky? with Uriah not knowing why he was killed. This whole episode is too hush-hush for it to be an example of David meeting out justice. David may have had legal authority to have Uriah executed, but he had no moral reason to do so other than to cover his own tracks. David has Uriah killed in battle for no other reason than to conceal what he had done. And by his own actions, David knew that if the news of his behavior got out, anything could happen. However, this doesn't change the fact that Bathsheba is still pregnant. And everyone knows that Uriah couldn't have been the father. And people aren't stupid. They know what happened between David and Bathsheba. And they know what happened to Uriah. Just no one said it out loud. Who would have the courage to confront the king? There was Nathan. Nathan was the only one. A word from the Lord came to the prophet Nathan. Nathan would be the one to confront David on his actions. He was the one with the moral and spiritual authority to stand up to the king. And Nathan didn't come out of nowhere. He was the court prophet, he's called, more kind of like a chaplain to the king, providing counsel. We heard from Nathan three weeks ago when he announced God's covenant to David, the promise that God would build a house for David. 
meaning that starting with David, God would build a mighty dynasty where David wanted to build a house of cedar, like an actual house, to house the Ark of the Covenant. But Nathan announced that God would build a house made of people, Israel. And Nathan was a historian. He wrote histories of David and David's son Solomon, which are recorded in the first and second books of Chronicles. He oversaw the music in the temple. Nathan lived at the heart of Israel, calling the nation to prayer as he had the king's ear. So Nathan was there right at the beginning of David's reign. He wasn't a convenient literary device, a mouthpiece to say what everyone else was thinking. Everyone knew that Nathan had the courage and the integrity to have that difficult conversation, to say what needed to be said. Nathan was the opposite of a yes man. And Nathan's strategy was inspired. Instead of going off on a rant about how evil David's actions were, Nathan just told the story and let David come to his own conclusion. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare, and it used to drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there was a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. David's eyes squinted, his hands clenched into a fist, his face turned red, and he thunders at Nathan. That man deserves to die, and he shall pay greatly for what he has done. You are that man, Nathan says. Busted. What was being talked about in hushed tones behind closed doors was finally now in the open. Now it can be talked about. And talk about it, they did. Nathan describes in detail everything that David had done as the people listen in with relief that David's behavior has finally been exposed. He killed Uriah and stole his wife, despite what God had done for him. Nathan's story had done its work, and David draws his own conclusions to the rich man's actions and thereby announces what should be his own sentence for his crimes, death and reparations. Since he himself declared that the rich man deserves to die and repay the poor man four times for what has been taken from him, then since this story is really about David, similar justice should be served. But instead, something worse had come into his house. David wouldn't die, but the child that Bathsheba bore from their union would. And then... God announced that David's dynasty would never be free from trouble and that David's troubles would happen openly since David's crimes were done in secret and thereby multiplying David's humiliation. But David knows what he's done. He knows he's been caught. And whether it's out of his own personal integrity or the fact that his actions have been exposed, he looks at Nathan and he says, Yes, I have sinned. I think David's confession was genuine. I think Nathan's story got to him. In this little parable, he feels the weight of everything that he's done. He recognizes that he has taken everything from Uriah, including his life, his family, and his future. When Uriah showed David nothing but loyalty and integrity, David is genuinely remorseful. And it was David's remorse that God saw. And so that Nathan said to him, the Lord put away your sin. You shall not die, but the child will. That's the price of David's sin. 
the child born from the terrible union of David and Bathsheba. This new family begins with death. But David loves this child. And he fasts and he prays and he weeps that God's mind will change. But when his advisors come to tell him that his child has died, they don't have to say anything. He already knows. He can feel this child's spirit leave the earth. And upon hearing the news of his son's death, David rises from the ground where he had been weeping and praying and fasting. And he started to eat. And David, um, you wept and prayed while your son was, al- was alive. But now that your son is dead, you're up and eating? Like, what's up with that? His advisors asked. Well, my weeping, praying, and fasting didn't help then. It's not going to help now. It's not going to come back. Time to move on. David may have been forgiven of his actions, but he still feels the consequences of his actions. He knows that neither his life nor the nation he is called to govern will ever be the same again. With a child's death, this ugly chapter has concluded. David comforts his wife, and together they have a son, Solomon, who represents the beginning of a new but more difficult era for Israel. God's judgment has been carried out. Israel's mood has been brightened, knowing that a son has been born from David and Bathsheba, certainly a blessing in the midst of national scandal. A page has been turned. They can finally put this episode behind them and look for new possibilities. But Israel will never be what it was. This moment in their history will always cast a doubt over them. They will suffer because of it. Their successes will never taste as sweet as they once did. They were humbled by their king's actions. Their future looks different than it once did. Smaller, they can no longer claim supremacy among the nations. Instead, they claim their place as those whose only special status is that God has called them by name and claimed them for God's own purposes. Sin has scarred them forever. God may have forgiven David, but that didn't mean that the nation was healed. From now on, they'd be walking wounded. And I think that's the same for us. When we know that we have been forgiven of our sin, but we often still, the, still feel the consequences of our sin. After all, sin isn't just about the vertical relationship we have with God. Sin actually affects our human, earthly, horizontal relationships. That's why in the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments are about our relationship with God. The other eight are about our relationship with each other, how to get along in this world. But what David began... David's son, Jesus, completed. And that's why Jesus put forgiveness at the heart of his message. Not just forgiveness from God, but to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with those whom we've hurt or those who have hurt us. Because we are all walking wounded. We all have the consequences of sin in our lives. We all carry within us the effects of sin in this broken world. And I'm not talking about moral judgment here, which we often think about when we think about sin. Sin aren't just the actions that offend God. They offend God because they are outside God's vision of a beautiful world. With sin, I'm talking about the effect of other people's selfishness, their ego, their misplaced ambitions, and their unhealthy appetites. And I'm talking about our own consequences of sin. Those moments when we hurt someone and the effects can last a lifetime or even beyond. We hurt and we get hurt. We sin against God, each other, and ourselves. Sin is that which keeps the world from being what God wants it to be. And God wants this world to be kind, to be loving to be just, to be compassionate, and to be peaceful. God's vision for this world is to be a place 
where all people and everything that lives and breathes grows into their fullest potential. God's vision for this world is for us to respect life and to help it grow and thrive. Because life in this world is broken and life in this world is beautiful. It is from a beautiful and broken humanity that God's best work is done. Because God knows that we aren't perfect. God knows that life on this planet is fraught with danger, selfishness, ego, and greed. And God knows that life on this planet is filled with kindness, humility, and love. And God is still building this world, repairing what is broken, finding what is lost, healing what is hurt, and lifting what is fallen. We may live with the consequences of our worst moments, but God transforms those moments into something that brings hope and newness to this troubled world so that we can again and again and again rise into something new. And may this be so among us. Amen.